Good morning. Welcome to worship this Palm Sunday with Cross Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. Welcome to all those of you who are here in person, those of you who are joining us online at this time or through the recording of today's live stream. I wish this were for effect. I wish I were able to tell you that I am playing the part of Moses or somebody this morning. But uh, as some of you know, those of you especially who are here for Lenten midweek service on Wednesday, my back went out. Ask me what I did. I got old. Uh, I don't know what I did. I didn't do any one thing. Uh, Probably accumulation of things. We've had a lot of uh, action around here, so there's been a little bit more setting up and taking down and table shoving and piano moving. Uh, But it just went. Uh, I'm not injured. Uh, I've been checked out. I just have uh, inflamed uh, nerves and muscles, and so I am going to be a little gingerly today. Thanks for the extra time uh, as you commiserate with me, so thanks for that. I uh, also should confess that I tried uh, this morning to get by with my non-prescription medicine. I came in very early today. About 8.30, it was pretty clear that uh, upright and somewhat loopy were going to be the better options than unable to get up from my desk. So um, you might need to correct me as the sermon goes along. Let's see what happens today. We are so glad to have you here in worship. We are also glad to welcome back our friend this morning's musician, Peter Nelson King. Peter, thanks for being with us again. Peter will help us ready our hearts for this festive worship with today's prelude. It's a work by a Swedish composer, Wilhelm Peterson Berger. Uh, Most of his work is from the late 19th and early 20th century. He wrote for piano, as well as five symphonies and other orchestral works. He wrote five operas and many songs influenced by Swedish folk music, including this one titled Lawn Tennis from his his 1886 Frosch Blumster. That's probably not anywhere close, but it translates as Flowers from Frozen Island, which is in a lake in uh, Sweden where... Peterson Berger had his summer home. It's a lovely movement that lifts our hearts and spirits as we prepare for today's festive worship on this Palm Sunday. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter, and thanks also to uh, Dr. Nicole Kim, uh, one of the many, uh, our favorite of, but one of the many who uh, help uh, share music with youth and kids with uh, music teaching and festivals. She had a festival yesterday and got our piano uh, tuned and back into right order in connection with that. Thank you for your generosity. We wave our palm branches and stand or sit as we are comfortable as the service continues with the Palm Sunday Litany. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should thank and praise our Lord and King Jesus Christ. 
With the Jerusalem crowd, we praise and honor him. We acclaim him, Son of David. The promised Messiah. As the crowd lifted their palm branches, let us lift up our voices to Jesus our Lord. Hosanna to King Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We sing together. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. For those who are standing, you may be seated as our service continues with the Kyrie and Canticle of Praise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are truly King of kings and Lord of lords. Receive our offering of praise and enable us to remain faithful to you in all circumstances. May we never turn from you, but ever turn to you in days of celebration and in our hour of greatest need. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of today's lessons. Reading from the ninth chapter of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. He shall command peace to the nations, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem, the word of the Lord. A reading from the second chapter of Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Please stand or sit as comfortable for the gospel acclamation.
The Holy Gospel as recorded in the 12th chapter of John. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival, that is, the festival of Passover, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. The Gospel of the Lord. We may all be seated. It's the getting up and sitting down. That's the hard part. Friends in Christ, grace and peace be yours from God our Father and from Christ the King, the Savior of the world. Amen. Perspective is important. Perspective tells us what viewpoint, what vantage we are looking at things. Your perspective, your point of view can have a profound impact on how then you understand something. For example, there's a story of three people who were viewing the Grand Canyon for the very first time. An artist, a pastor, and a cowboy. And they all stood together on the edge of the canyon, and they all each let out a a cry of exclamation. The artist said, oh my, what a beautiful scene this would be to paint. And the minister said, ah yes, the wonderful example of God's handiwork. And the cowboy exclaimed, oh no, what a terrible place to lose a cow. (laughs) Perspective matters. Perspective impacts this festival of Palm Sunday. If we only view it from this, as a Sunday before Holy Week, from that point of view, then today can be just about palm branches and parades. But when we look back at Palm Sunday from the viewpoint of Monday, Thursday, and particularly Good Friday, then the triumphant entry and the shouts of Hosanna have a bittersweet echo to them. For many of these same people who today line the roads of Jerusalem and wave their palm branches and cheer on the son of David, the promised king, will also be among the crowd that hatefully hisses, crucify him, just five days later. Let's imagine that we were travelers to Jerusalem that day, that first Palm Sunday. We wouldn't have been coming for Palm Sunday. We would have been traveling for the festival of the Passover a celebration of God's liberating work for our people in the past, freeing us from bondage and slavery to Egypt and passing over our homes when the 10th plague, the angel of death, came to set us free. So imagine that we've come in from the countryside a little early for this festival of Passover. As as we arrive, it's clear that the city has something even more special than normal going on for a Passover, For months, people all over Judea and Galilee have been talking about this man, Jesus, wondering if maybe he was the Messiah, the long-awaited-for king who would save his people and reestablish David's throne. You can't argue with his miracles, and it's clear from his teachings that he is a leader with confidence and courage. We would have heard how he was addressed as a descendant of David, and so when we hear the crowd and see the palm branches, we run to join and gladly shout with them, Hosanna, welcome, the King of Israel. Or we might imagine ourselves as a resident that day, someone who lived in Jerusalem, worked there, a businesswoman perhaps, who prided herself on knowing just about everything that was going on in the city. If that were us, we would have been excited to hear that Jesus had come again and very hopeful that he really was the king and Messiah that everyone said he was. After all, this would be very good for business if someone else were in control rather than the Romans. They took so much of our profits, our taxes. The Pharisees weren't much better. They were bad for business with all their rules and regulations and thou shalt nots. 
but you'd seen Jesus stand up to them. And it seems maybe finally something good was going to happen to your people, the Jews. And so you close your shop and join the crowd, join in the happy hosannas, and pledge yourself to your new Messiah, your new King, Jesus of Galilee. Or what if we were one of the 12, the disciples? They were probably the closest to understanding what was really going on, but that's not saying much. The dominant thought in most of their heads probably would have been something like, well, it's about time. They had decided long before that, that the Messiah would come to set the people free. And they were convinced that Jesus was just that savior. It was good to see the people of Jerusalem finally coming to the same conclusion and cheering on their master. If we were among that group, we would have imagined what it was to feel this personal pride as well as pride of nation. As Jesus enters the city, at least some of his glory would rub off on us. So we can imagine that, that Sunday, what we now call Palm Sunday. It was exciting and enthralling and energizing. That's what you want when you come near Jesus, isn't it? Something that's exciting and energizing. That's what we hope for when we come to worship, right? Something to get us pumped up, to put us in a spiritual positive frame of mind. And that first Palm Sunday, that triumphant entry, certainly would have done that. But then comes Monday. The parade is over. The palm branches are already beginning to wither. And for the most part, Monday means back to the real world, back to your real life. Monday after Palm Sunday must have been a bit of a letdown. Unlike what many in the crowd had hoped for, Jesus didn't dispatch the Romans, didn't raise an army, didn't demand an audience with Pontius Pilate, didn't set the stage for a rebellion or a revolution. Well, sure, he went into the temple and he kicked out the money changers and the cheats, but that wasn't particularly king-like behavior. It was a start, but you'd have to begin wondering on Monday if maybe you'd been a little premature with your cheering and your trusting the day before. Then comes much the same on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, which would have only raised more questions. Your pledge of allegiance, your royal welcome for Jesus, all that faith you put in this man from Nazareth on Sunday somehow now seems out of place. Now all he seems to want to do is go to the synagogue and talk religion. A king may have come, but it wasn't the king that you were expecting, and his kingdom is nowhere in sight. And then finally it's Friday. And maybe you'd heard that the leader of the Jews claimed that this Jesus was a fraud, a phony, even a heretic. Maybe you were confused or frustrated or disappointed, even maybe angry. This isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't the kind of king we were looking for. So maybe you begin to doubt. Maybe you begin to wonder. What happened between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? What went wrong? How did the shouts of Hosanna become cries of crucify him? On Friday, Jesus was still everything that he had been on Sunday. He indeed was Lord and King and Messiah and Son of God and Son of David. But things had changed for some of his followers. What happened in between the palms and the cross? Where was their Sunday faith on Friday? Where was their Sunday faith on Friday? Where is our Sunday faith on Friday? Or Monday, or Wednesday, or any other day when we're not gathered here together? You know, the number one criticism the world wages against the church, against Christianity, against us churchgoers, is that it seems to some from the outside that those on the inside sometimes say they believe in one thing or stand for something, but sometimes act a different way. And I would go even farther and guess that that's probably our number one criticism of ourselves. Our Sunday faith doesn't always match up to our Friday actions, our weekday activities. We can talk a great talk on Sunday morning and sing our hosannas and bless the name of Jesus, but sometimes 
Some of us, sometimes, all of us, will fail to follow through with our lives lived out for Christ the rest of the week. Or am I the only one who has that challenge sometimes? When we think of the great betrayals of history, we tend to think of the acts of extreme and active treachery. You know, like Judas Iscariot, Marcus Brutus, Benedict Arnold, and the like. But if there were any way to evaluate such things, we'd probably find out that the greatest betrayals have involved people who simply did nothing, didn't show up. People who were inconsistent or unreliable, pledging one thing and doing another. You don't actually have to be among the crowds of Palm Sunday and Good Friday to have our actions revealed when we shout out of both sides of our mouth. Because doing nothing at all for Jesus is as much a betrayal as crying out for his crucifixion. And we all have been there. We all have been called and responded. But we've also been called and failed. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that even our betrayals, our apathy, our inactions, our hypocrisy, even these sins are sins that Jesus was willing to die for. That's the whole reason for the cross. Because while Palm Sunday's double-edged message ought to motivate us to try to live as faithful, full-time disciples, our standing before God isn't based on our efforts or our actions or our failures. When we're honest with ourselves and honest with God, we understand that we do not have the strength or the power on our own to keep away from sin and unbelief to live perfectly in accordance to God's will. We say so much very often when we gather together. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. When we find that our faith fails us in spite of our good intentions and best efforts, we don't turn away from Christ in shame, but we turn to him and take hold of his hand, take hold of his cross, and that's what Holy Week is all about, a a reminder for us that when we repent of our failures, we will find forgiveness in the blood of the only begotten Son of God, poured out for us, each one of us, and for the whole world on Good Friday. And so we trust that Jesus is our King, and our Christ, and our Savior, and our Lord, and that he has done everything for us not only suffering and dying in our place to pay for our sins, but being perfectly obedient in the way that we could never be, and then offering his righteousness in our stead, justification, just as if I had been as faithful as Jesus. Saved by grace through faith alone, let us walk now with Jesus this Holy Week pilgrimage to the cross and beyond, to the empty tomb, where God kept his love-inspired promise to save us and set us free. Free to love God, free to love one another, free to love ourselves, free to love our neighbors near and far. On Sunday and Friday and every day for the rest of our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll remain seated as we sing together the hymn of the day.
to stand in your sin as we profess our faith in the ancient and trustworthy words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers of the people. As we come before God with our prayers and praise and our petitions for the church, the world, and for all people everywhere according to their needs. In this season of Lent, the petitions will end, Almighty God, and your response is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Blessed one, today the church sings glad hosannas as we enter Holy Week. Prepare us to bear witness to Christ's suffering and death endured for our sake and to celebrate with joy his conquest over death, sin, and the grave on Easter morn. As we join with the faithful throughout the world on our journey to the cross and the empty tomb, grow in us and your whole church unity of mission as we share the good news of your grace revealed through Christ the risen one. Almighty God, hear our prayer. Creative one, renew your good creation and protect the balance of life on earth. We thank you for both rain and sunshine, equal partners in growth. Remind us in this season of new life of our calling to grow in faith, to bloom where we are planted, and to bear the good fruit of service and sharing with all the earth and all her inhabitants. Almighty God, comforting God. Bring hope to any who feel forsaken or forgotten. Make a way to safety for refugees and asylum seekers. Reunite families enduring separation. Comfort all who mourn, including all those impacted by the horrific traffic accident in Renton this week, claiming the lives of children and adults connected with members of this faith community. Almighty God, hear our prayer. Inspiring one. Give energy and joy to pastors, lay leaders, bishops, worship musicians, choir members, and all who are preparing for worship for this holy week. Through music, liturgy, litanies, and prayers, and your word read and spoken upon, help us hear anew the story of Jesus and your amazing grace. Almighty God, healing one, bring comfort to all who suffer, healing to all who are sick, and hope to all who grieve or despair. Draw near to all in need, including our members and their loved ones who have asked for public prayers. Ann Basler, Anna Barrow, Dennis Barrow, Jeff Corwin, Lois Corwin, Alma Constable, Linda Ernst, Suzanne Fisker Anderson, Audrey Harris, Pastor Ivor Haugen, Irene Kessler, Carol McCandless, Judy McNaughton, Pat Merriam, Conrad Roseberg, and Carol Shelley. Family members and friends, Kathy, niece of Lois Corwin, Frida, mother of Lugana Isanika, Jeff, son of Jerry and Joyce Johnson, Carol McCandless's daughters, Kathy and Maureen and her friend Linda, Arlen Nordhorn's wife, Frida, and son, Justin, and Brad, son-in-law, and Charlie, grandson of Carol Shelley. Almighty God, Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive our prayers spoken and silent through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share a sign of peace with those who are seated near us and with those of you who are joining us online. Peace be with you this day.
sharing a word of peace, we share a word of thanks with you as well for all the ways that you uh, are the ministers of Cross of Christ and share in our mission uh, as we worship and grow and share and serve and welcome. Thank you for your financial support as well. It's critical for the ways that we are able to reach out to one another and to our neighbors around the block and around the world. Those who are worshiping in person, the ushers will wait upon us now. You can also leave your offerings in the baskets in the narthex. You can mail your check-in, drop it off in the uh, locked mailbox. We check that uh, virtually daily, and it's safe and locked. It's a drop box, so no one can reach in there. You can also give online, and you can set up automated giving, as many of us have. If you'd like to learn more, speak to our bookkeeper, Denise Fuentes. Now we thank the ushers for waiting upon us and Peter for this musical offering. Thank you, Peter. I so appreciate uh, the music that you bring to us and the uh, musical voices that you allow us to hear. The service continues with Holy Communion, beginning with the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be he with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Heavenly Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in life and faith and bring to us the fullness of grace that belong to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. On the very night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new promise. My blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, 
his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we unite our hearts and our voices, praying as the Lord taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Here at Cross of Christ in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we practice open communion. All are welcome to come and experience the presence of Christ in bread and in wine. Brian will be offering you the wafer today and also has gluten-free bread. Uh, just let him know as you come forward uh, if that is your need or preference. Following that, the first tray with the darker liquid is wine and the second with lighter is grape juice. There are the double-sealed self-serve uh, uh, communion cups as well. First seal for the wafer, the second for grape juice. Whatever empties you have, please put it in the basket. Uh, we'll be brought forward by the ushers by different sides of the sanctuary, first here and then the balcony. Then we'll move the furnishings uh, for uh, logistic reasons, transept, and then this side until everyone has had the opportunity to come forward. If there are those who need or prefer to receive where you are, it'll be our holy honor to bring communion to you in the pews. Please note that today we are singing two communion hymns, first Lamb of God and then one bread, one body. Will the one who is serving come forward and thanks to Brian for taking my place for communion as well.
Worship continues with the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's always a blessing to be able to worship together in all the ways that we come together. Once again, for those of you who join us uh, via the live stream and the recording, you are uh, blessing us as we are gathered together with the Spirit, and we always want to make you aware that we think of you as you think of us, and we join together in worship. Thanks for the many partners of mission and ministry also this week. It's been a very busy week, and many have done uh, a lot of work in the name of the Lord, so thanks for that. I do want to just make another note, and I know Peter loves it when I call him out. The improvisation that was not planned or scheduled that uh, you just did in three or four variations uh, added a great deal to our communion time. Thank you for that. Some other announcements. I'd love you to join us for adult faith formation in the library following worship from 11.15 to noon. We're starting part two of our series on Lutheran worship. This is called, Why Do We Say That?, Biblical Elements of Lutheran Liturgies. And so we're going to go through our Lutheran service and just um, explore where in the Bible we get um, the words for things like our creed, our confessions, our litanies, some of the prayers we pray today, benedictions, and so much more. We'll also uh, play a very fun game called Bible, Ben Franklin, or Shakespeare. So uh, some of the things that we think are in the scriptures are not, and that'll be a fun way to get started. Join me and the others as we grow in faith together uh, following worship in just a few moments. Having entered into Holy Week now with this Palm Sunday service, we also want to welcome you to the services of the rest of Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Both services will be at 6 p.m., 6 p.m., I know in years past we've been at seven, we've moved it forward listening to those who uh, find that a little bit easier not only to get to but to get from while we still have some light. So uh, 6 p.m. on Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, both services are powerful and beautiful, filled with wonderful music and we invite you to come. Easter Sunday, uh, 10 a.m., Lots of extra special music. Uh, We'll have uh, Martha Freitag not only as our organist, but she's been our music uh, creator uh, for this service, bringing with her uh, a uh, violinist. We are putting together a Easter choir and a lot more uh, to help us celebrate uh, the uh, resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Speaking of the Easter choir, those of you who have said that you will join, there is music if you haven't picked it up on the information desk, and it's not too late. We're going to have one rehearsal this Wednesday at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, here in the sanctuary, and then we'll have a warm-up rehearsal on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. And so if you could make either one of those, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, let me know so I can get you music as well. Uh, and Martha is bringing uh, more of the music uh, for our parts on Wednesday. Today's the last day to make a donation and dedication for the purchase of Easter lilies and other flowers for next Sunday. There's a form and a box at the information desk, and we just ask that you put your dedications and donations in the box. Don't put them in the offering basket. That doesn't get opened until uh, our bookkeeper comes, and she doesn't come every day. So we'd love to make sure that your names and dedications are a part of that. Even if you're not prepared to make the donation yet, and you want to make a dedication and give the check later, that's perfectly fine. Just put it in the basket at the information desk. As always, there's so much more going on in and through Cross of Christ this week and pretty much every week. So... Read all about it in our all-member email sent out every Thursday. Keep your lay leaders, volunteers, and staff in your prayers. Our service will continue with the benediction, the sinning hymn, and the dismissal dialogue, followed by Peter's postlude, another lovely piece. This is by Reuben Goldmark, an American composer and teacher of renowned students Aaron Copeland and George Gershwin. If you're familiar with that music, you'll hear the influence of Goldmark on them. The piece that uh, Peter will play for us is called In the Rushes. And it sets a perfectly melancholy mood as we transition from the festival of Palm Sunday to the meaningful, powerful services of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. As always, we encourage you to stay and worship through the end of the post loop. But if you do choose to depart, that's perfectly fine. Just please do so quietly so that those who remain will not be disturbed. Thanks in advance for your thoughtful courtesy. And now, once more, we invite you to stand or remain seated as comfortable for these words of blessing and benediction. We journey to the cross with Christ, the Father's only Son, guided by the Holy Spirit. Peace be yours this day and always. Amen. Let us sing together.
Jesus said, as I have been sent, so also I send you. By God's grace, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to worship, worship God, God, grow in faith, share the gospel, serve others, welcome all. Thanks be to God. Thank you.